Hello, can you hear me? Great. So, greetings from NIPS. We were the, uh, basically the whole company, 15 people. Um, the whole company and a few others. Uh, there were, I think, something like 30 people from Finland, 30, 40 people in total. So the Curious AI company was very well represented from, from Finland. Uh, as you, if you don't know NIPS, then, well, it's the biggest, biggest conference in this, this field, I would say. Uh, it was in Barcelona this year, which was nice. It was warm and uh, it's much nicer to go there than Montreal or, or I guess next year it's going to be in LA. Um, if you have visited NIPS before and haven't done that for a few years, you will be surprised because NIPS has changed enormously. I didn't have the, uh, the statistics for, for this year, uh, unfortunately. I, mean, I don't have a graph for this year, but already last year the graph looked like, like this. So it, it had been growing like almost tenfold uh, over the past 10 years. And now the growth continued so this year uh, it was 50 percent percent larger than than last year and the the whole conference was sold out so many many people wanted to get in but couldn't get get there they, they couldn't register so um, of course what what has led to this growth is deep learning deep learning boom uh, which has so, so if you if you think about it, it, it accounts for, uh, in in some sense, more than half, clearly more than half of NIPS. Um, then again, when NIPS NIPS has been growing, I think it has also opened up room for for other machine learning things to to grow a little bit. So actually, uh, the papers were pretty diverse, um, but. Well, then, then again, that, that depends on how you classify. So um, very many papers were using deep learning one way or another. It's just that they were applied to many, many different things. So there wasn't a category deep learning as, as such so, so clearly present in, in NIPS. Um, so if you think, like, what was big in NIPS this year? I would pick single out generative adversarial networks they had been growing enormously so compared with say last year or in, uh, particularly year before when they were basically non-existent they they have made a big uh, big entrance um, so it's a um, generative adversarial networks were um, advocated by Jan Lekan in his his plenary talk for instance and um, him being such an influential figure in NIPS, that's, that's part of the reason why, why so many uh, people are interested in everybody needs to now work in GAN in order to do something useful, so it seems. Um, there's, there was another interesting um, breed of uh, networks which is more related to, well, it's also related to unsupervised learning. So basically GAN is, is solving unsupervised learning somehow. Uh, there's another breed. I'm going to explain you this wave nets and byte nets and so on, at least to some, some degree. Um, last year, variational autoencoders were a big thing. Uh, this year, there was not so much, much of it. Yes, there were still, there were still many things, but uh, in this say unsupervised learning um, setting, clearly GANs are now, now the, the thing that people are talking about. Um, compared to last year, I would say that there was quite a bit of recurrent neural networks. Uh, now uh, there were many applications to video, for instance, and I'm going to say a few words about that. And then um, deep reinforcement learning was also a big thing. Um, there were not that many talks about bandit problems in the, in the oral talks, but in the poster session there were enormous number of uh, bandit, bandit papers. 
So I thought that I'm going to explain you more in detail what GAN, this generative adversarial networks are, and also this new breed of um, video pixel nets and um, pixel CNNs and so on. This, so I'm going to try to explain. There are two different ways of doing uh, unsupervised learning uh, and they can be applied to also semi-supervised learning things, though both of them um, I mean, I, I guess main applications so far that I've seen are for generation. So being able to generate video, sound, pictures, and so on. So the basic idea of generative adversarial networks um, is that there, is, there are two networks. One of them is trying to generate, and the other network, called a discriminative model, is trying to, um, it, it's like a critic. It's saying that, ah, now you did good, uh, now, now you did bad, or now you did good. And the way it's trying to discriminate is kind of Turing test. So it's trying to recognize whether this image is real or whether it was generated. And when it's trying to do this, it's actually learning. Um, the discriminative model uh, is, is learning to, to find all discrepancies of what is the distribution of the, uh, of the samples that the generative network gives compared to the true distribution of samples. And the generative network is trying to generate samples from the same distribution as they occur naturally. Um, it's a kind of um, game theoretic problem. So they are, these two networks are trying to uh, optimize, oh, the other one is trying to maximize the similarity or like m make it as confusing as possible and the other one is trying to discriminate. So they are b playing this game and they are reaching a Nash equilibrium while doing so. Um, I'll, I'll check if I can get a um, video demonstration of um, some, some kind of demonstration of this. Um, it's here, I hope. Yep, here it is. So <coughs> I'm going to press reset and something funny is going to happen. So the blue curve here uh, is the data distribution. Um, sorry, I can't move it any, any higher up. Uh, the blue curve here is the data distribution. So there are two, uh, two Gaussian bumps, basically. And then the green curve there, now I'll, I'll press reset so you see how, how the green curve so starts uh, start changing. Um, the green curve is the discriminator network trying to figure out whether this is real or generated. And the red network here is a network which is generating samples from some random value. So it's just one dimensional problem to make the illustration easier. Basically, the, the generation network is just trying to map uh, uniformly distributed random value between 0 and 1 to the observed value. And this, this nicely al already demonstrates what's difficult in GANs. So in principle, GANs are very nice. Uh, but the problem with GANs is that it's um, it's highly unstable. So getting GANs stabilize the learning is extremely difficult. Uh, maybe if I can decrease the learning rate here, maybe maybe it'll uh, it, it will do something something nice. Let's see. Uh, no. So the problem is that when the discriminator network realizes that okay, these samples must be generated because you're always generating something like this then the generator will learn, okay, well, I will generate these things instead. And then the discriminator network will, will be, so they will be chasing each other. Or the discrim discriminator is chasing after the generator and they, they can be running in circles forever. So um, it's extremely hard to get them working, but it's also very nice for the machine learning community because everybody can publish their new papers. Like, now I made this tweak to GANs, and now they are a little bit more stable. Um, 
so anyway, this, of course, th there were very many nice, nice examples of um, really good generations. Uh, let me see if I can get the. Oh no. So here is an an example of a very recent um, uh, generative adversarial network, which is generating pictures of birds from a description of a bird. So for instance, um, this may be a sea seagull looking guy there, on the third one from the left is a bird with a medium orange bill, white body, grey wings and webbed feet. And then that's what it generates. So you can... So there are three different networks that generate Yeah, yeah, okay, so three different networks. The, the lowest one, which is the latest one, uh, I guess from this week, uh, published this week. So it wasn't really in NIPS, but everybody in NIPS was talking about GAN. So I just wanted to show you uh, one of the, one of the best, best examples. So yeah, it, like from distance, many, many of you I think will recognize, well, this looks like birds. I could, I could have seen this kind of image in the wild. Uh, if you look very close, you'll see that, oh, okay, actually it's a little bit funny. Uh, like, if you, if you play, pay close attention to, to the bird head, they are missing eyes and small details like that. But overall, like, the big picture is, is pretty good. So, uh, there were extremely many different varieties of of generative adversarial networks. Some of them were this kind of conditional generation. Like you have some, you, you want to somehow guide also the generation. So for instance, uh, maybe you want to say that there, this kind of placement of my, my like, okay, I will want to generate a picture of a house and with this placement of windows and, and so on. And then it would generate uh, somewhat photorealistic images. So anyways, this was something which was not doable at all a few years ago. So it's a like clearly clearly there's there's a lot of progress and it's it's interesting. There is still a um, long way to go because it's it's so unstable. Um, okay, so I hope you got some idea of generative adversarial networks, what, what the idea is. Um, in unsupervised learning Many, many methods are trying to somehow model the distribution of the data. Like some, somehow we are, we are using the distribution of the observations in unsupervised learning. And these generative adversarial networks are doing that using this kind of game where, where the stable solution for the game is such that the generator will generate samples from, from the real distribution. Um, there is an other, other uh, variety of models. Um, so basically the problem of modeling P of X is that if it's a joint, dis well, it's, if you take an image, it's a very, very complex joint distribution over the pixel values. And modeling the whole distribution is extremely difficult. So there is one breed of networks that, that actually um, rely on completely sequentializing the data and then modeling the data as an autoregressive model. So basically, uh, if we take the joint distribution of all the individual elements and then we write it as a dis probability of the first, first element times the probability of the second element given the first element times the probability of the third element given the two previous elements and so on, and for me, it's a little bit crazy idea, but people are actually doing this for even videos. So they are completely sequentializing a video. So they are taking RGR channel of the first pixel on the left upper corner, G um, channel, B channel, and then R channel of the second pixel, and so on. And they are just making this, in some sense, a sequence and then modeling the probability of each and every sample given the previous samples. Now, it's, 
easy to understand how that would happen in, say, sound, where the, the samples already are sequential. So you just make a convolutional network that will take as input all the previous samples, and then try to predict, so what is this sample? Um, when you train this system, you don't have to do it one sample at a time, but if you build the network properly in such a way that at every, um, every layer, you, you, if you take any one feature, you know exactly which pixels or which, which elements it has seen. So that you sort of maintain the order of these pixels throughout the network. It's very easy to see how that happens in, in time series, like simple time series like this. It just means that every feature only needs to look at that, that time instance and the previous ones. Then we know that at that time point, it, it only depends on the, on the pixels so far. And that's why we can, in parallel, train this network. So uh, this, this network will, um, will learn to predict in parallel every element given all the previous elements up to that point. Uh, so uh, again, I have for, for this one, I have a demonstration, which was from DeepMind's blog. So the idea, idea being here that you, when, when, you, unlike, when you generate, actually, then you have to do it sequentially. So you, you calculate uh, the probability of, of, of the next sample, and then you take that sample as an input, and then you generate. So gener during ge generation time, this is extremely inefficient. You have to, like, e even, even with this Google cluster, they have something like 90 times uh, slower than real time during generation. But the generations can be very nice. So they have applied it, for instance, for speech generation. Um, so let me see if I can get these audio samples. Uh, the 1980 American Romance and Adventure film directed by Randall Kleiber. Let me see if, was that too loud or too low? So who says this was too loud? Too silent? Others were happy, so I want, I, I want to. <laughs> so, okay, so again. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. Okay, and then this is concatenative speech gener generation. So both of these parametric and concatenative are like existing technology in some sense. And this is now WaveNet, which is generating the audio sample one sample at a time, 44,100 samples a second. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. Okay, so the speech quality here, or the sound quality here isn't really good enough for you to distinguish. So you can, you can go and find this WaveNet your, yourself. Um, so also what's funny is that if you don't tell it, you don't, um, you don't um, condition the generation with, with the acoustic information, then you can get... That's like babbling. So I couldn't babble that kind of nonsense English. Uh, so it's, it's kind of funny. Okay, so it doesn't really have a good idea of language, obviously. So it has very nice acoustic model, short term, but it doesn't really get the big picture. Um, so it's also been used for making music. Right, 
So if you, if you try to generate a very long sequence, you'll notice that the style will change and so on, because it doesn't really have any, any idea of, of what's happened beyond the acoustic sample that it sees at that point. So sometimes it will, it will do something funny. Yeah, so it's, if, if you would try to listen to a symphony uh, composed by this thing, I, I think you would go crazy or, or something. Um, still, it's, it's pretty nice, entertaining. So, what about uh, uh, images? Because it's, it's fairly easy to see how, how this works for... Um, one, um, one dimensional thing, but then how does it work for multi-dimensional thing? And there's this thing called pixel CNN that was presented in IPS. Let me see if I can get it. Oh, no. And the idea is that when you are making convolutions, each convolution, like in, in this case, you, you have ordered the pixels in such a way that they have an order. So the pixel on the upper left corner is the first one. And when you are looking at the, and, at the pixel in certain location, then you are only allowed to see the pixels that are sort of before you. So all the convolution kernels are such that there is nothing, nothing from the pixels that come after. So the, all the rows below and all the, all the pixels to the, to the right are zero. But otherwise, just convolution kernels. And then also the R RGB channels are ordered so that the R channel doesn't see anything else. B ch G channel sees all just the R channel, and B channel sees R and G channel when, when it's making the prediction. It's completely arbitrary. The way they, this ordering happens is completely arbitrary, but still, that's, that's how it's done. And then this thing can generate um, images. So this is conditional generation from class Robin. So in, in case you don't know, Robin is a small bird. Um, I guess it has a <coughs> yellow ch uh, red chest or something like that. Don't, don't remember the uh, punarinta Suomeksi. Yeah, punarinta, something like that. Um, so in some sense, these are more varied than the, the GAN generation. These don't have so, so clear detail and so on. It's, it's another other way of doing it. Um, there, is al there was also something called video pixel network. I'm not going to go into details, but basically the idea being that you, you condition on all the frames that were before, and in this frame, using the same idea as this uh, pixel CNN, so that so basically you, you take the whole video and order it into pixels and R RGB channels, and then you, you use this network, which can learn to make these predictions in parallel for all pixels. But when you generate, you really have to generate the whole freaking video, one uh, RGB channel at a time. So it's kind of a crazy idea. But still, Google with his, them, their clusters seem to be able to do it. Um, so this video pixel network, uh, I think it has now by far the state of the art in, in generating uh, flying MNIST digits. So the data set is, is completely artificial. It has two MNIST digits flying around. And um, the, uh, I guess the, the true continuation is in the middle here. There was some competing model, which is just predicting the next frame, which is the one in the up, and it gradually loses the sharp digit uh, identity video pixel network below, uh, maintains the digit identity uh, throughout the generation. So it's very nice, state of the art by far, and, and so on. Um, I don't have here, but there was also a, um, they have applied it to natural video, 
well, kind of natural. So robot moving, moving things around, R robot poking, ob ob um, moving object with its hand, and it's sort of semi okayish except that it doesn't understand anything about objects and so on. Everything is like rubbery, uh, warp type thing, and uh, it, it also forgets e easily like what was behind behind something. So, but I guess people also have this change blindness thing. So. Um, it, it's still, I think, one of the be best generation systems, um, competing with GAN, I would say. OK, just a few other things. Uh, recurrent neural networks were a big thing, as I said. There were several papers about various ways of analyzing and classifying different RNN structures. Um, there, were, there were interesting papers about connections to ResNets. Um, and then there was a very interesting extension of LSTM cells uh, fa called, called FACED LSTM, which basically added uh, mm, one gate to LSTM cell, which models the internal evolution of time. So it's, it's very nice, nice uh, modification for a system which can which need to de deal with, say, event data. Because in some sense, during events, when something, when the change happens, then time passes. But in between events, nothing happens, so time doesn't progress. And the, the phased LSTM idea was that ma make this kind of delta T gate explicit in, in the LSTM and let the system learn itself when the clock is ticking, when something is happening. And they were able to show that it learns faster in many, many tasks, and it can learn event-based tasks, which are very difficult. It can also deal easily and naturally with um, streams of data that come with different um, uh, time step. So for instance, there was, there was a application to lip reading system, which got video video frames at certain frequency, and audio at much higher frequency, like sampling rate for audio is much higher than for video. And they were able to keep these in sync using this, this idea. Um, there was a lot of reinforcement learning also in NIPS. Um, as I said, there were many bandit problem <coughs> posters, particularly bandit problems are uh, motivated by recommendation System. So when you buy from Amazon, you get recommendations like, why don't you buy this thing too? And it's kind of, um, this, this action is, comes from a huge number of possibilities. So it, it fits well with this bandit, band, bandit idea that you, we need to give a recommendation, choose a very, very small set of recommendations, and then let's see how well that leads to new, new shopping decisions, for instance. Um, there, was, there were a few papers in reinforcement learning workshop about 3D environments. Like that, that's, that's where reinforcement learning is now going. So game, game playing environments, which are doom, doom type of environments where you actually have to navigate in, in 3D environments that, that seems to be now um, within reach. Uh, there were a few papers about using auxiliary tasks for for making reinforcement learning more stable, and then there was also <coughs> there were several papers about model-based reinforcement learning. I'm not going to say more about that. If some of you happen to be interested in reinforcement learning, particularly um, or these recurrent networks, then you can uh, talk to us. We can we can maybe give some nice nice pointers. But now I'm going to give the floor to next speakers, uh, I think Antti Tarvainen and you were going to talk about ResNets. OK. And then, then there was um, Isabo Premon Schwarz is going to talk about Right, so something related to uh, working memory. That was also very interesting. Um, there, there were many, many papers about memory adding memory to recurrent networks. Uh, and that's, that's one of the 
examples.